every week uh, there is something happening uh, in Israel or about Israel uh, that is indicative of Bible prophecy and the ever near approaching second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in it, uh, its two phases. The rapture of believers, the church age believers, and his uh, return to the earth after uh, the tribulation to set up his glorious kingdom upon the earth. Well, what's happening uh, in Israel today? Well, uh, of course, Israel is still uh, viewed as the enemy by a great portion of the world. And uh, Iran seems to be leading the charge uh, these days to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Uh, I beg to differ with uh, the president of Iran and uh, say that if, if anything, it's going to be Iran that's going to be wiped off the face of the earth. And uh, the Lord is going to protect his people, Israel. Uh, the thing that's happened this past week uh, has been uh, some kind of rapprochement between the Hamas and the Fatah in the Palestinian, uh, uh, what do they call it, Palestinian Authority, uh, and uh, whereby they might be willing to have the president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, uh, Abbas, uh, meet with uh, a counterpart from Israel to discuss uh, some kind of peace and approach toward a two-state situation. Whether that works or not, uh, time will tell. Uh, whether it's even a good idea, time will tell. But at any rate, uh, that's what's on the table these days to bring about some kind of, of peace. Uh, probably one of the uh, best things that has helped Israel to have some modicum of protection from the crazies that would come over and destroy uh, Jewish people right and left is the wall. Uh, the long fence, it's mostly a fence, uh, but a high fence, uh, much of the length of the, uh, uh, of the, of the land of Israel. And that has kept uh, some of the terrorists from coming into the country and uh, doing their suicide bombings and so forth, to a certain extent. At any rate, uh, the saga continues, and uh, it seems as though, and I am, I'm sure it is truly the case, that uh, Israel will, will not really have peace. There may be times of peace, there may be seasons of peace, we'll not have peace until the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world, comes uh, to Israel uh, and to the world and uh, brings about that peace. Well, now we are continuing the book of Acts, part two. And this is the study of the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. And it's, it's one of the more fascinating chapters in the book. And it tells us uh, a lot about what uh, is happening. Uh, last week we saw the Jerusalem conference in which it was uh, decided decisively, I believe, uh, in the mother church in Jerusalem, after much disputation and uh, debate and uh, discussion, that Gentiles were to be accorded full uh, welcome and membership into the body of Christ, those who believed in Christ, those who accepted Jesus by faith, came to know the Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, but without any other conditions, uh, such as uh, coming under the law or circumcision or any other thing, uh, nothing would hinder them from uh, becoming 
uh, members of the body of Christ, uh, along with the Jewish people that have come to know the Lord. So now, Paul and Silas uh, are going back to the churches where Paul and Barnabas had established in Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey today, and uh, visiting the cities uh, throughout the area where they had uh, proclaimed the gospel at the first. So now they, uh, it says in uh, chapter 16, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. This was not the Kentucky Derby. Uh, don't get it confused with that. Uh, this is the city of Derby uh, in central uh, Asia Minor, or what we know as Turkey today. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And uh, apparently, uh, Timothy uh, came to know the Lord either through... Paul's first visit there to the area, or through his mother and grandmother, who were both Jewish, and uh, who uh, had taught him from his early youth in the Word, as we learn about in uh, Paul's letter to Timothy later on. Verse 2, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. So already he was uh, well known to the brethren, that is to the body of Christ, to the believers uh, in those cities. And apparently was assuming a certain amount of leadership, uh, though he was a young man. Verse 3, Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Well, wait a minute. I thought Paul and Silas were going around this whole region telling uh, Gentiles that they did not need to be circumcised in order to be followers of Christ. And one of the first things that Paul does when he finds Timothy here is to have him circumcised. What's going on here? Is it a contradiction? No. Because the circumstances uh, are different with Timothy. Uh, notice that Titus was not required to be circumcised having gone to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem conference. Why? Because he was an out-and-out -out Gentile, and he was a, an Exhibit A that you didn't need to be circumcised to be a member of the body of Christ. Now, what about Timothy here? Well, he was half Jewish. His mother was Jewish. And Paul wanted him to go with him in a ministry which included uh, ministry in the synagogues among the Jewish people. Now, if he had stayed there in uh, Lystra, uh, Iconium, and so forth, and just <coughs> stayed there, it, it might not have made any difference, and uh, he could have just gone along as he was. But if he was going to go with Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, into the synagogues and among the Jewish people as a witness, uh, that was a different matter. And it was not a matter of justification or salvation that Timothy was circumcised, but as a matter of ministry. Uh, a matter of uh, having a testimony, uh, in this case, among the Jewish people. They knew that his father was a Greek, and that was probably why he was not circumcised uh, in his youth, even though his mother was Jewish. But now that he was going to go in uh, ministry like this, it was decided that he needed to be circumcised, even though he was in his, uh, well, certainly he was of age. So, 
we have uh, the interesting uh, demonstration of how certain things are done not for salvation, not for sanctification, but for the purposes of ministry. Yes. Dr. Christenbaum says that that the covenant between the Jews, Jewish people, and, and the Lord, the covenant of circumcision has never changed, that it's still in effect. He, it, in his work, he, he says that that's still a necessity for a Jew. Yes. Um, there's a debate among uh, Jewish believers in Christ. Uh, the question is that this is a uh, uh, belief among Jewish believers, like Dr. Frickenbaum, that uh, Jewish people, uh, young Jewish people who are believers in Christ should be circumcised as part of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, much not, not to say the uh, Mosaic covenant. And I believe that that is true. And there is a debate among Jewish believers, should they circumcise uh, their their sons? And the overwhelming uh, conclusion is, yes, they should be circumcised uh, uh, ritually as part of the Abrahamic covenant, being physical descendants of Abraham. So this continues on. And uh, uh, the the church uh, conference in Jerusalem and the preaching of the Apostle Paul didn't change that at all and uh, was recognized. Okay. Verse 4. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So here it's very clear that they were carrying around the letter from the Jerusalem Council uh, about the liberty of uh, in the church and uh, for the Gentile believers who had accepted uh, Christ and who were about to accept Christ. Nothing would be uh, put upon them as far as the law was concerned. They were to abstain from uh, things, off, uh, meat offered to idols, and uh, from uh, fornication, which uh, uh, the root of that, the Greek word there is porneo, from pornography, <laughs> but also all illicit sexual activity, and uh, from things strangled, uh, eating of blood, and so forth and so on. And the purpose of that was not to give unnecessary offense, uh, to the Jewish people who were reading the law every week in the synagogues and uh, would be offended if somebody said, well, I believe in the Jewish Messiah, but was doing these things. Okay. Uh, verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. So the church was growing. People were becoming believers. This New, uh, newly decreed liberty was having a bona fide effect uh, as the gospel was going forward uh, in that whole region. Now here's a picture in our uh, handout. By the way, did everybody got the handout? Uh, okay, is it back there on the table? Make sure it's chapter 16. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Paul is instructing Timothy. Timothy was uh, one, one of Paul's best disciples uh, throughout his life. He traveled with him. He was uh, ordained to uh, minister in certain churches where Paul directed him. Uh, he had some uh, feelings of insecurity about his youth and that the Lord exerted him, exhorted him uh, through Paul uh, to overcome. Uh, and, uh, but he was, uh, by and large, uh, considered a very faithful uh, disciple uh, and a good friend of the Apostle Paul. And uh, in a little bit, we'll be talking about the vision of the man from Macedonia. 
this strange vision. Uh, somebody asking Paul to come and help him uh, over across the Bosporus into Europe, the man from Macedonia. But it took them a little while to get there. Verse 6, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, they took the northern route uh, in northern central Turkey. Uh, and the Holy Spirit forbade them to go into Asia. Well, now that's a little confusing to us because what is Asia? I mean, we think of Asia, well, uh, that means that they couldn't head over toward India and China. Now, that's not the case. The Asia that is referred to here is the uh, region, the province, as it were, in southwestern Turkey, where Ephesus was and others. Now, we know later Paul was allowed to go to Ephesus. In fact, that became uh, almost the centerpiece of his uh, ministry, but not yet. Uh, the Lord was not ready for Paul, or apparently the gospel to any large degree, to go into that region. The region, the, the province of Asia, where Ephesus and uh, actually the seven churches of Asia. You remember that uh, phrase uh, in the book of Revelation? Well, that's the region it was talking about. Now, boy, did it ever get the gospel, uh, that region, uh, later, but not now. And how did the Holy Spirit forbid them? We're not told. But <laughs> it almost comes to mind the story of Balaam and his donkey. Uh, as he was heading toward his assignment to go and, and, and curse Israel, Balaam uh, was riding on the donkey and the donkey wouldn't go. Stop dead in his tracks. And Balaam couldn't figure out why. He said, he called the, the beast a disobedient beast and everything. But later we understand through the talking of this uh, remarkable donkey, uh, the miraculous talking, uh, that he was seeing an angel uh, standing in the way with a sword. Balaam didn't see that, but his donkey did. The donkey was a lot smarter than Balaam, uh, and a lot more spiritual, it seems. But at any rate, uh, he, he was forbidden to go any further and, until uh, a little later on. And you wonder, well, what, what was forbidding Paul and his associates from heading into southwest Turkey? We don't know. Uh, was it circumstances? Perhaps. Maybe ever. Have you ever been in a situation where every door was closed, you just couldn't go in a certain direction you thought you, you might want to go, and you just couldn't get there? You couldn't go. You couldn't. There wasn't any uh, support in it. There wasn't any interest in it. There wasn't uh, every time you asked somebody, the door was closed. Was it like that? Uh, or was there some revelation that uh, Paul got? Uh or a vision of something. We don't know. We just It just says that he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go. But I think all of us have had some kind of experience where doors just slam shut in one direction and then open up in other directions. And we perceive that as being the, the leading of the Lord. And after they came to Mysia, verse 7, they were trying to go into Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. They couldn't do that either. Couldn't go to Bithynia. That was in the in the northern part of Turkey, right? toward the uh, toward the uh, Black Sea. They couldn't go. Well, as we learn later, the Lord was moving them in a direction toward Europe, but that wasn't apparent to them at this point. All they knew is they they couldn't go. 
where they were trying to go uh, in two different directions. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troy. Troas. Troas. Troy. Plays a relatively minor role in the New Testament, but a tremendous role in ancient history. There was a great Trojan War uh, of which Homer spoke and became one of the great uh, old mythological histories of the ancients. Uh, the Trojan War, uh, the, uh, the Odyssey, and the Iliad, and so forth. Yes? Time frame line up. Have, have they already had those wars at this time? Oh my, yes. Uh, the question was uh, did they already have those wars? Yes, they were fought somewhere before 1000 BC, maybe 1500, something like that. Um, maybe around the time of the judges and David, you know, somewhere back in long ancient history. Uh, and, of course, here we are in the first century when this is uh, writing. But uh, those wars and the writings of them have come down to us from ancient times. And they're still, people are making movies about them today. Um, <clears throat> and one of the great stories of archaeology is the rediscovery or the discovery of Troy by Heinrich Schliemann. Yes. Uh, good Irish name. No, no. He was, uh, he was from Berlin. Heinrich Schliemann. He loved Homer. He loved Homer. He is sometimes called the father of modern archaeology. Uh, he loved Homer. Uh, he was not interested in the Bible that that's, that wasn't an emphasis of his, but he loved Homer, and he, he believed Homer. And he believed that uh, the Trojan Wars were historical. And he believed that there really was a Troy, but nobody knew where, where ancient Troy was. You know, there was this uh, more modern in the first century Troy. But nobody knew where Ancient Troy. In fact, scholars, all the scholars of the early 1800s, that's when Schliemann did his thing, uh, believed it was all just mythology. It had no historical basis at all. Uh, but Schliemann believed otherwise. He became uh, rather successful in investing in real estate in Paris, France. And as a young man, uh, became rather wealthy and retired and decided to fulfill his lifelong dream of uh, proving Troy existed. And Homer was uh, an authentic, authentic as far as the history was concerned. And geography. Well, with, a, with uh, the book of Homer in one hand and a spade in the other, uh, he began to investigate uh, Troy. And by using all the geographical indications in Homer, an island here, a river there, a hill there, and this, all these different things, he pinpointed where he thought ancient Troy existed. And it took him uh, and his young Greek wife uh, a couple of years, but they uncovered this magnificent city uh, where Troy was supposed to be. It had been covered up for all these centuries. And uh, great walls. And he even discovered a great treasure chest, which he called the treasure of Priam. And uh, with all of this archaeological evidence, he came back to uh, Berlin and established a museum dedicated to these findings. Well, fascinating. But he was a precursor of those 
uh, archaeologists later in the 1800s who came with a Bible in one hand and a spade in the other and began to explore the biblical historical evidences and uh, discovered that the Bible is history and is real and is uh, authenticated. Well, they got to Troas. Verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So we have the Macedonian man in the vision saying, Come over here. We want you. Help us. In contrast to whatever had happened before about going into the province of Asia or into Bithynia where they were forbidden, it, they were being pushed along to the west until they got to the shore uh, and the Bosphorus there at Troy. And now <coughs> there's nothing but water in front of them. The division between uh, Turkey and, and Europe and now this Macedonian man appears in the vision. Come over and help us. Macedonia, of course, is what is uh, what is um, northern Greece today. Northern Greece. And uh, so to go to Macedonia was going to uh, what we know as Greece today. Verse 10, when he had seen the vision, immediately we, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What's different here? What is new here in this? We. This is the first time we appears in Acts. Before it's they, third person, did such and such, and all of a sudden, now, it is we who are doing this and that. This is the first mention of we? This is the first mention of we, yes. So, what does this indicate? Luke is with uh, Dr. Luke <coughs> has now joined the apostolic band here. And uh, uh, where? In Troas, in Troy. So, this suggests very strongly that Dr. Luke was a Trojan. He didn't go to USC, but he is still a Trojan uh, from Troy. And that he joins the band. Now, <clears throat> why? Well, what profession was Luke? He was a doctor. And the implications are that Paul had some kind of malady that needed a physician's attention. Uh, many of us believe it had something to do with his eyesight. And uh, whatever it was, from this point on, he has an attending physician. Furthermore, he's going into uncharted waters. He's going into... Uh, Europe, and perhaps Paul felt additional need for uh, uh, assistance and help. Uh, after all, Paul was a native of Asia Minor. He was from Tarsus, who was in south, which was in southeastern uh, uh, Turkey on the coast of the Mediterranean. But now he was going into areas that he'd never been before. He was going to Europe, and so... Maybe he felt he, he really needed an addition to Timothy, <clears throat> Silas. But it's good to have a doctor along. And uh, we can sympathize with that a lot. So, they, they uh, went into Macedonia. Paul, and Luke was with them. And he wasn't just a historian recording these things. They said, 
that God had called us, all of us, to preach the gospel to them. Alright. So we learn pretty quickly as uh, we go into Macedonia uh, that Paul is, is preaching the gospel uh, initially in the town of Philippi by a river there. We'll get into that in uh, some depth. I'd like to point out that uh, Dr. Bob Rossman here uh, over at this table here has a has a travel log uh, and uh, uh, picture gallery uh, book there of his trip to uh, Greece. And it begins with pictures of Philippi. So if you want to see some pictures of Philippi during the break, uh, take a look at his, uh, his book there with all the interesting pictures. Uh, verse 11. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis. Now this is the first instance we have of Luke's fascination with the sea. Uh, when we get to the 26th, 27th chapters, he gives us a, a real a lesson on navigation. First century navigation and seamanship and how you uh, navigate the Mediterranean. Uh, but this is his little taste of it right here. They're just going across the Bosporus here. And, uh, but he says they took a straight course. In other words, they didn't uh, have to tack. Uh, they could just go straight to Samothrace. And on the day following, to Neapolis. And from there, to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. So Philippi is the first town that they get to where they really begin to preach the gospel. It was a Roman colony, which means that it had a certain status uh, in the Roman Empire. And as a citizen of Philippi, you had certain privileges that people in other cities uh, in the area and, and elsewhere did not have. It was, it was truly a colony. People had come out from Rome to settle it to a certain extent and uh, joined in with uh, some of the local people. But at any rate, it was a Roman colony. Verse 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went out, we, notice he's now still we, he, he keeps on with that we for some period of time. On the Sabbath day, what day was that? Saturday, Saturday yes, yeah, seventh day of the week, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. What was he looking for? He, he, was, he was looking for a synagogue or Jewish worshipers who would go to the riverside. Well, now, if they didn't have a synagogue in the city, uh, why might they have it on the river? The what? There was no minion. There was no minion. That's why they didn't have a synagogue. What's a minion, by the way? Ten, Ten righteous men. Ten righteous men. Uh, and uh, if you didn't have ten, ten righteous men, ten Jewish men is in their thinking, uh, who loved the Torah, who read the Torah, uh, you couldn't have a synagogue. You got to have ten men to have a synagogue. Where do you? Why? Why that number? How did they come to that idea? Any idea? Back to Abraham. Back to Abraham. That's a long ways back. 
Well, what did Abraham have to do with ten men? Well, of course, there was this debate he had with the Lord. Lord, you would not destroy uh, Sodom if it had 50 righteous men, would you? No. If there were 50 righteous men, I would not destroy them. 20! No. Don't be angry with me, Lord. One more time, I ask 10! If there are 10 righteous men, I will not destroy Sodom. <laughs> well, that seems to be the uh, sine qua non. That's the bottom line. you got to have ten righteous men uh, to preserve a sin. And uh, that was taken as the uh, number that was required for a synagogue. Well, but, okay, they didn't have enough uh, to have a synagogue. So, why would people go, and why would Paul expect them to go out to the river? Washing. Well, what kind of washing? Ritual. Ritual washing. So the mikvah. A mikvah could be used. Uh, there on the riverside, they could do their ritual cleansings and so forth. And quite probably that was the reason why the riverside was chosen as a place uh, of worship on the Sabbath day. And they were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. They had surveyed the area during the days before. Hey, there's a river out here. Maybe they, maybe they have prayer out here on the Sabbath. And we sat down and, speak, and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Apparently there weren't any men there. There were women who were uh, worshiping there on the side of the river. Verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Now, this is really remarkable. You know, the, uh, uh, the liberal intelligentsia don't like Paul. <clears throat> it might well be said that they hate the Apostle Paul. And um, for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons is they, uh, they describe him as a misogynist. Well, what is a misogynist? Somebody that hates women. Somebody that hates women. A misanthrope is somebody that hates men. But a misogynist is somebody that hates women. Well, how would they get that idea? And they, uh, they don't like some of the things that uh, the Apostle Paul says uh, concerning the relationship between men and women. And they assume that what he says about these relationships is based upon cultural circumstances. And, uh, well, that uh, the, they assume that the women of the first century were uh, downtrodden, were oppressed in many ways, had no standing. But I want to suggest to you that this episode here uh, belies all of that. <clears throat> and uh, that when Paul has an opportunity to proclaim the gospel uh, to a group of devout women, he takes the opportunity and capitalizes on it and uh, accomplishes quite a bit in it. Secondly, I want you to look at this woman, Lydia. She is no piker. She's a traveling saleswoman, perhaps, or at least a uh, an export-import uh, businesswoman of some means and of some considerable capability. 
He's a seller of purple fa uh, fabrics from Thyatira. And Thyatira was a city over in Asia Minor. It's one of the seven churches of Asia. You remember. And she apparently, and that's where they make this, this purple dye. And she apparently had brought the skill and the fabrics and the dye making over into Macedonia, into Philippi. Well, I believe that makes a good place for us to break and uh, have our refreshments here in fellowship locally. And what is our uh, interview? We have Chuck Missler. This evening. Chuck Missler uh, today. Our interview with uh, Chuck Missler, a remarkable person who is uh, not only a teacher of the Word and a pre preacher of the Gospel, but is uh, high up in military industrial circles in this country and among government people. So uh, you will want to hear what he has to say about uh, eschatological circumstances. Well, welcome back to the uh, study of the book of Acts. And we are in chapter 16, beginning or continuing with verse 14. I trust those of you uh, web students who saw our interview with uh, Chuck Missler appreciated it very much. He is a fascinating uh, personality. Loves the Lord and he has access to information that very few of us do. We, <clears throat> we're looking at verse 14. The first convert in Europe was not the man from Macedonia, but a woman named Lydia. And uh, before we get into that, we uh, have the uh, offering uh, for the work of the Lord here. And uh, we'll pass the uh, offering box around. And if the Lord has blessed you, we uh, trust you will uh, uh, work with us in the support of this ministry of teaching the Word here and around the world. It was this woman from... Uh, Thyatira, which was across the, the sea there in Asia Minor, Thyatira, where they made this purple dye. You know what they made the purple dye out of? Snails? What? Snails? snails. Indeed, it was snails that were <clears throat> had a very potent dye. In them, and if you squashed them, they, they were just this purple dye would would uh, flow out. So this is that they got this very very strong purple dye out of that, and they were able to uh, dye fabrics with it. And purple was considered the clothing of royalty, so it was a very much uh, desired uh, type of. Uh, clothing that was dyed with this uh, strong purple. But she was a seller of purple. <laughs> she was a businesswoman. Yes. You think she was a single lady? Do I think she... That she was not married because she oh. invites them home yes. and her husband's Jewish. Right. I, I think she was single. Uh, she was a single woman and uh, she owned her own home. She had this business. I would suggest to you that Lydia is quite an example of uh, <coughs> the liberty and status that women had in the first century. She's not alone. Uh, and uh, was apparently a, a leader of some sort among the women there in Philippi. Perhaps she's the one that organized the a worship service there on the Sabbath day among the women there. At any rate, uh, she was uh, a, a woman of considerable standing. <clears throat> Not only that, she loved the Lord. She worshipped God. She, uh, if she was not Jewish, she was a, uh, a God-fearer, uh, like those who had attached themselves to the synagogues in Antioch and in Pisidia and elsewhere. 
and uh, was a uh, devout worshiper of the Lord, and knew something of the Old Testament apparently, and was uh, very open to the gospel when Paul came there to present it. <clears throat> and she was influential in uh, assisting Paul and the his entourage uh, uh, later on. And when she and her household had been baptized, where do you suppose they were baptized? <laughs> In the river, right uh, by there. <clears throat> she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. She's got a house. Apparently it's large enough where she can have a, a full entourage of, of guests. Uh, there were at least uh, half a dozen there uh, who uh, were along with Paul. And, and they accepted her uh, gracious invitation. And she prevailed upon us. I guess that means she twisted our arms and we accepted her invitation. Uh, but they're very hospitable. And uh, again, uh, you have to uh, be uh, rather amazed from what you hear about such things uh, in modern discussion that she had all of this freedom, all of this ability, all of this uh, uh, leadership, all of this uh, <coughs> wherewithal uh, to be able to run a business, a successful business, and uh, had room and to spare for guests who would come by. A very interesting person, uh, Lydia. So here we have an artist's conception of Lydia receiving the gospel. And uh, uh, you can see the river there and the group of women who had come there to worship the Lord on the Sabbath. Well, uh, Lydia was one kind of woman. Then uh, as we go along in the story about Philippi, there was another kind of woman, a slave girl, uh, who uh, followed Paul around and uh, really became a nuisance uh, to Paul and Silas uh, as they were preaching in the city. <clears throat> this is uh, some of the ruins of ancient Philippi. Somebody asked, well, what does Philippi mean? Or what was it named for? Well, it was named for Philip. <laughs> uh, the father of Alexander the Great, Philip of Macedon. And uh, this was uh, the city that was named after him. <clears throat> now, here we get into this other story, 16, the other girl. It happened as we were going to the place of prayer... A slave girl having a spirit of divination met us. What is a spirit of divination? Uh, what was that? Demon. Uh, <clears throat> divination is uh, d divining um, uh, insight, uh, prophecies, and so forth, from a satanic source. It's akin to uh, witchcraft. And she had this evil spirit, but uh, she made a bunch of money too. <laughs> Even the slave girl was making money for her masters. But this was, you know, like the palm reader or the fortune teller of today. You go down the street and you see this house and it has a big hand out in front and it's palm reading. Uh, Madam so-and-so does such and such and will tell your future and so forth. That is a, if it's not a spirit of divination, it's an attempt to be a spirit of divination. Uh, we have them with us today. And uh, this, this uh, woman was uh, bringing... A considerable profit to her owners by this spirit of divination. I will tell your future. 
I have a relative that went to a fortune teller one time. And she told my relative, as a young woman, uh, that she would be in a plane crash. And she'd be the only survivor. Well, she died, my relative died about, well, about a year ago. <clears throat> and to that day, she would never fly in a plane with anybody she knew. The, uh, the, the message was devastating. Ruin your life in, in some respects. Uh, we have these today. Verse 17. And, and by the way, she did not die in a plane crash. Hmm. Verse 17. Following after Paul and, and us. <laughs> Luke is careful to get us in there. He, himself in there. And he was right there with them. Following, Paul, following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. What's wrong with that? <clears throat> Why would a demon spirit announce that? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and why, why would a demon spirit have that message? Yes. Oh, you were scratching your ear. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's dangerous. It's dangerous in this class because we think maybe you got a good word for it. That's all right. Uh, well, what was her intent? I believe to bring disruption to the situation. What she said was true. These were servants of the Most High God. And they were proclaiming the way of salvation. But look at the source of the message. This woman who was going around and you know, telling fortunes and for profit. So, it became a nuisance. What she said was true, but she became a nuisance. Verse 18, <clears throat> she, con she continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, he wasn't addressing the woman as such, but to the evil spirit that was in her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. <clears throat> and he didn't do that immediately. It was after several days of this that he got so exasperated and began to see that whatever she was doing was harmful to the proclamation of the gospel. That he exorcised the demon. You ever seen anybody that's demon-possessed? I've seen a few that I, I would definitely say, yes, this person is demon-possessed. Um, but apparently this, well, this woman was demon-possessed. And when Paul commanded the Spirit to come out of her, the Spirit came out. So you see, her abilities were not just natural abilities. They were supernatural abilities, but they were demonic. <clears throat> now, that was good for the, for the young woman, wasn't it? But it was bad for her masters, they felt. Uh-oh. <clears throat> now she's lost her powers... Now we've lost our meal ticket. We've lost our profit. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. 
No, just don't touch my pocketbook. If you do that, you're in big trouble. As long as you were just uh, going along, preaching the gospel and so forth and so on. But now that you have uh, taken away our uh, gainful employment through this demonized woman, uh, you're in big trouble. And they dragged him before the, the police, the judge, the authorities. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrates, they said, These men have, have cast out a, 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 a demonic uh, a demon out of uh, this woman, and it's cost us our money. Is that what they said? No, no, they, didn't. they weren't even truthful about their uh, opposition to this man. These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. Oh, that, that, that explains everything. That's always a good uh, charge. These, these people are Jews, and they're, they're bringing in confusion. Well, what more do you need to say? Well... Obviously, they were anti-Semites. <laughs> Obviously, they hated the Jewish people. And that was about all they could figure out to accuse Paul and Silas uh, in their accusation. Why, well, they're Jews, and so naturally, they're just bringing confusion and tearing up our city. And are proclaiming customs which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. That's a new argument. We can't believe in Jesus. We can't believe the gospel because we're Romans. What does that have to do? Well, what did Romans do? They worship other gods. They, they worship many gods. Caesar. And Caesar. <laughs> they worship idols. They worship all kinds of gods and goddesses. They had the Pantheon built in Rome. You ever seen that? Yes. Why did they? Uh, why didn't they believe her that this was the most high God way of salvation when they believed her for making money? But they didn't believe this part. Well, why? Why didn't they believe her message that she was saying about the uh, Paul and his his friends? Uh, and they believed her for uh, the prophet, uh, the fortune telling she was doing. Well, did they really believe her? I'm not sure they ever believed her. But she was making money for her. She was a means to an end. And whatever she was doing fortune telling didn't bother the Romans. Yeah. Uh, because the Romans had all kinds of uh, superstitions and mythologies and idolatries and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, I don't think they minded too much when uh, she was saying all these things, nice things about, uh, apparently nice things about uh, Paul and his friends. Because apparently they were still making money out, out of it. He was drawing a crowd. She was working the crowd. And uh, <clears throat> probably still making money hand over fist. Maybe even more so because of the situation. But when the, the demonic spirit is cast out of her, uh, things change. And now they saw, hey, she's not going to be any help to us anymore. Uh, so I'm not really sure how much they believed of what she was saying anyway. But now their, their money was gone. And so... Uh, uh, they bring these accusations against them. And that we can't follow we can't follow these people because we're Romans. It's unlawful for us to do these things. Where, where does the law of the Romans say that you can't uh, believe in Christ? Where uh, does the law of the Romans say that you cannot believe in the God of the Bible? Well, you know where. They, they believed in all kinds of gods. So, 
Anyway, this is the argument they brought against uh, Paul uh, and uh, tried to make it stick. And uh, apparently they did. <clears throat> Verse 22. The crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates <clears throat> tore their robes off of them. So where was the last time we saw that? The what? Lystra. Lystra. Oh. Uh, oh, they tore, tore their robes off of uh, Paul and Silas. Yes, that, that was a place in Lystra where they stoned uh, Paul uh, and left him for death. So that this was part of their punishment, get their robes ripped off of them and then order them to be beaten with rods. It's a privilege to be a missionary, isn't it? <laughs> Anybody been in a missionary situation where you had the city turned against you? <laughs> Tom and Barbara can tell us of spot in northern Israel where a similar thing happened, but they were saved by the police. <laughs> Here, Paul and his entourage were beaten with rods. What an introduction to Europe. Welcome. Come over to Macedonia and help us. They were beaten with rods. Some welcome. Verse 23. And when they struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer, to guard them securely. <coughs> now, what's wrong with this picture, by the way? Why should they have not beaten Paul like this? Uh, he was a Roman. And he, uh, he didn't get a chance to plead his case in, that, in this situation. Everything was uh, like a mob closing down on But it was strictly against Roman law. You're talking about being un-Roman uh, uh, to beat a Roman in this manner. Uh, but uh, they did. And uh, put them in the jailhouse. Verse 24, And he having received such a command threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Welcome to Europe. Welcome to Philippi. Uh, there they were in prison. In the inner prison. If there was a dungeon in the deep dungeon of the prison. And their feet were in stocks. You ever seen stocks? Yeah. You ever been in one? <laughs> I, I, I played like I was in one. Uh, where was it? Back in Williamsburg or something like that? They have stocks uh, on display there. Very uncomfortable. But that's where they were. So they began praying, Lord, get us out of this mess. Why did you have us come over here? Look at the failure that we have here. Nobody loves us. Nobody accepts us. Uh, we're in big trouble. All because we came here and began preaching the gospel. Is that what they did? Well, we have a picture here of Paul and Silas. Maybe that's why what? They wanted Luke with them. Luke, yes. <laughs> he, he was a BT too, I think, though. But probably he was a big help to them uh, in the stocks, in the, in the jail. Uh, Paul and Silas stoned and beaten by the people after healing the slave girl. Yeah. 
A prison-like chamber at Philippi is pictured here. In antiquity, jails were not designed for long-term punishment. They were dark chambers where prisoners were held until they could be tried or punished in other ways. Prisoners were commonly chained during the day. At night, their feet were often placed in stocks for additional security. Verse 25. Well, there Paul and Silas were in the, the jail, moping and moaning and groaning and bewailing their condition, right? No. Verse 25. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. <clears throat> And the prisoners were listening to them. Yeah. So, the Lord put us in prison while we're in, in jail. We'll, we're not going to discontinue our testimony for the Lord. We've got, we've got uh, Macedonians right here in jail with us. We'll proclaim the gospel to them. Hey. Yeah. So that's all right, isn't it? <clears throat> wherever they were, in season and out of season, in jail and out of jail, they were going to preach the gospel and sing and pray at midnight. Verse 26, And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Earthquake came. Strange. Shook everything. And it it just completely tore up the prison. Broke down the walls. Burst open the stocks. Flew open the 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 door, the gate of the prison. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's <coughs> chains were unfastened. Very interesting earthquake, wasn't it? Was it how how widespread was it? Was it localized right there in that spot? In fact, the whole city of Philippi? Whatever it was, it really did a job on that jail. Verse 27. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, that was a Roman custom. If you were a soldier, in this case a jailer, and had prisoners under your responsibility and they escaped, that was your responsibility. And... Uh, is worthy of death. So many uh, would have, many Romans would have seen that and would have just committed suicide on the spot. <clears throat> well, he could have argued, though. Well, look, there was a huge earthquake here, and everything burst open. I, I didn't have anything to do with that. I'm not responsible. No, he understood his responsibility. Verse 28, But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Nobody took the occasion to run out. Would you have done that? I mean, would you have... Uh, <clears throat> here, we've got to get out of here. This is tremendous. And make a break for it. But uh, they apparently... You know, what was going on here? These guys were singing praises to the Lord. This tremendous earthquake happened. Apparently they were all sitting there listening to Paul and Silas. And uh, to the gospel. And they, and they made no effort to run out. And Paul said, we're all here. Don't, don't do any harm to yourself. Well, this was the guy that threw him in the stocks. He might have said, man, 
this guy's going to kill himself and he deserved it. Uh, and been delighted at seeing the, the jailer kill himself. No. This was another prospect for Paul. Somebody else he could tell about Jesus. And uh, he says, don't harm yourself. We're, we're all here. That wasn't the last time he said that in the book of Acts, by the way. And he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. But what a change. The guy he threw into jail, put him in stocks, slammed the door shut. Now he's falling down before them. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must, what must I do to be saved? Greatest question in the Bible. We don't know the answer to that question. We are bound for eternal death. But he had the question. He had the right question. Now why did he... Why did it occur to him to ask that kind of a question? What had he seen that persuaded him that he needed to get saved? Well, he'd seen the earthquake. He'd seen these men uh, standing there calmly, not trying to escape. He heard the man tell him, don't kill yourself. We're not going anywhere. And perhaps in the interim, they had begun to tell him about salvation. And he, enough to where he felt comfortable in bringing them out into the open. And he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? For the I time? think he saw the testimony of these men that they were from God. They were willing to die for what they believed in. Yeah. And even when they were in jail, they didn't faint, they didn't run. They still kept their faith. And that's what we need to do. And they, and they sang. And they sang. And prayed. Uh, <laughs> when, when most of us would be grousing and complaining and say, Let me out of here! Uh, I don't belong here! I'm innocent! Yeah, yeah, where's my lawyer? Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, my, my question was answered, but I have another one. Oh, okay. Uh, we know that, according to what we've read and everything, that uh, Luke was with them. As being with them, why weren't Luke and the others of the entourage put into jail as well as Paul and Charles. The question is, why why weren't Luke and uh, the other people with Paul thrown into jail with him? Yeah, because it only mentions actually Paul and Silas being thrown in jail. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to the others? Did they go back to Lydia's house and wait the night? Um, and we're not told where, where they are. Uh, and, but apparently you're right. They were not there. And uh, Perhaps the people, the magistrates, felt that they were not the, the most serious uh, problem. It was Paul and Silas that was really the problem. Uh, At any they, rate, they're the only ones indicated as actually being in jail. They were the ones that took away the livelihood of those men. Yeah, yeah they were the, looked on as the ringleaders uh, of the opposition. Uh, <clears throat> but he's asking this question. What must I do to be saved? What a powerful question that is. Until we get to the point where we ask that question, uh, we're really lost. And this man was coming out of lostness into redemption. Uh, earthquake breaks, shakes the jail. Now this, this picture shows uh, their hands in the stocks. However... <clears throat> The scripture only says that their feet were in the stocks. Uh, so that, um, but that's one artist's view. The jailer is saved. 
Yes. Verse 31. The answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? And that uh, is the, the, the question of the natural man. I have to do something to be saved. You see? Uh, you figure if you're going to be saved, uh, it's, it's, you've got to do something. That's, that's what he assumed. He must have been quite surprised when the answer came back. Verse 32. And they spoke. Or verse 31. They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's what you do. You don't do anything. You believe. You receive. You trust in the Lord Jesus. And I'm sure they go on, or had already mentioned, that, that he had, why you believe in him? Because he has died for your sins. He's risen from the dead. But believe on him. You'll be saved. <clears throat> you and your household. Now, a lot of discussion has been about that last phrase, you and your household. Some have interpreted it to mean, well, if you believe, then not only will you be saved, but your whole household will be saved because of your belief. That's not a scriptural teaching. If his household believes along with him, the whole household will be saved. That's the point. So, it was belief. Belief in the Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Savior, you're saved. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. It was important that they heard also so that they could believe and be saved. Isn't that a wonderful way that the Lord has of redemption, of salvation? You hear the word. Nothing else that brings salvation. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. Verse 33, And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, the very one who was partially responsible for the wounds being there, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. So, they, they heard, they believed, as he did. They were baptized. It was a tremendous picture of redemption and salvation. The jailer and his family were saved. Verse 34. And he brought them into his, his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with you see, the whole household. With his whole household. Yes. It's amazing to me that Paul would still want to baptize him after being arrested, being beat, being jailed. I'd kind of be like with Nineveh. You know, let me out of here. You know? <laughs> but he still had that spirit within him to see that this man was uh, The point is that, that after being beaten by these men, by this man and his uh, fellows, and scourged and uh, put into jail and stocks and everything else. He loved this man and wanted to reach him for Christ. And then baptize him. <clears throat> it's quite a story. But uh, in a sense, this was the first man with his family in Europe to believe the Lord. To be saved. So the vision of the man from Macedonia was becoming fulfilled. It's a picture of the jailer with Paul. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think Paul was so nicely dressed at the time. Uh, his clothes were probably in tatters and whatever. But nevertheless, the message was there. 
and salvation was there. Uh, this picture of the ruins of the church at Philippi. There's ancient churches uh, in the area. It's going back to the first centuries. First century. Verse 35. Now, when day came, what, what a night this was, you know, from midnight when the earthquake came down now to, to daylight. Now, when the day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, Release those men. They came to his house, you see. He said, now, now go back to the jail and you release those guys. We, you know, they spent the night in jail. Uh, let them go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrates have said to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. Uh, it's all right now. The magistrates say, you're, you're okay. You know, you've, you've, you've done your time. Uh, a night in jail, that's all we want. And we don't want you around anymore. Well, what would you have said? Oh, goodness. Thank, thank the Lord. Uh, the magistrates have come around and, and they're not against us anymore. We're not going to be get beaten anymore. Well, let's go. Um, we've, had our, we've had our time here. But Paul said to, ha said to them, nothing to it. said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial. Men who are Romans. Silas? It must include Silas. Maybe includes Luke. <coughs> but you've got uh, uh, at least two, maybe more men who had Roman citizenship <coughs> and have thrown us into prison. And now they're sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring, them, bring us out. You want to get us out of town? You come in person. Apologize to us. And uh, we'll leave. But not before. Uh, he was standing on his civil rights in this case. He didn't have a chance to express them when the mob was coming on him. But now the magistrates... He says, uh, you've got some uh, explaining to do here. You've got some apologizing to do here. You come yourself and apologize <coughs> publicly. And we'll go. Verse 38. The policeman reported these words to the chief magistrates. They were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. They knew they weren't supposed to treat Romans this way. After all, they'd been accused of being Jews. And they were fair game. But to, to attack Romans this way? Oh, no, no, you don't do that. That was their thinking. Now they discover, uh oh, they are Romans. With certain privileges. Certain civil rights that other people do not have. Verse 39, And they came and appealed to them, and when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the city. Please, pretty please get out. Don't, don't stay around anymore. We're sorry for what happened. We're begging you to get gone. No, that's quite a difference. Verse 40, They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. We're not, not so fast. We've got to say our farewells to our friends here, the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. All right. So, uh, now there were brethren in the city who had been established. And uh, there was a church now at Philippi. And quite an action that it happened. Here's a Roman courtyard in the house of the of the Vedi at Pompeii. This picture is here because it's it's similar to houses throughout the Roman Empire. 
It may look something like what Lydia's house looked like, with the courtyard and everything, flowers, nice uh, uh, kind of uh, house. So that is the uh, 16th chapter of the book of Acts, the story of the <coughs> invasion of Europe with the gospel <coughs> and how it all uh, began. And we are the beneficiaries of that movement into Europe of the gospel. Uh, it has continued moving west uh, throughout the centuries, and we, we have received the gospel in part because of the movement of the gospel into Europe. It has also gone elsewhere, but it seems as though the greatest reception in history of the gospel of Christ was to the west in Europe and in America today and um, in the Americas. So uh, what happened in Acts 16 is very important to uh, our own salvation and exposure to the gospel. Well, uh, next week, the Lord willing, we will continue to Acts 17, one of my favorite, because it has the message of Paul uh, to the Gentile intelligentsia in Athens. So don't miss next week. And we look forward to having you. And uh, Brother Tom Terry, our pastor, missionary, missionary to Israel, uh, come and uh, lead us in our podcast. Good to have you with us again. You know, I listen to many, many hours of preaching and teaching during the week. I usually sit up till midnight, listen to shortwave or later. You never hear preaching and teaching like this today. It's just almost non You just don't hear it. It's not there. Uh, a lot of times, a pastor he'll just take he'll just take one verse and they'll expound on it forever and ever and ever. But Dr. Tom has always gone through the scriptures word for word. And here a little, there a little, and it all comes together and it makes really good sense. You know, you can't do that without some dedication and having the Holy Spirit there upon you in the form of word and people who want to hear and want to understand. I thank God. I think he's made uh, this chapter very interesting. And uh, it, it comes to life. You know, that's the way the Bible really is. It's a living book. It's not a dead history. It's a living book. But it takes a man of God to bring that forward to see what it is. And I know those of you who are online with us see that and you know that. That's why you stay through this whole class and I know you're benefited by it. And Dr. Tom in this class would like to see you take what you've learned in this class and put it to use for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to have some prayer requests. And who do we have online, Mark? Uh, well, one prayer request has happens for Kathy's mother. For Kathy's mother. Uh, she was feeling tightness in her chest. Mm -hmm. Tightness in her chest. That could be wrong. Uh, she has had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. She's also got hiatal hernia wow. and acid reflux, which wow. can mimic some of those. So we'd ask for her health and Kathy's uh, rewardism. Uh, <laughs> Kathy the war reward. Remember the for uh, Kathy the war Also, her, um, her, she doesn't feel there's anything to worry about right now. There's nothing to worry about. But it's best to be safe. But her basically pray for her health and her, shall we say, her instinct to know if something is wrong yes. to go ahead and call. Also, also, uh, Dana. Dana. Her dad. Yes. How's he doing? Uh, she's asking. Other than continuing prayers for salvation. Amen. We'll her, do that. her whole family, basically. Yes, uh, he's a diabetic. Oh boy. Uh, and his heart is only pumping at. 20 some odd percent. Mm. It's yes, in the 50 so. percent that it should be uh, since he's had a heart attack and didn't even know it. Yes, we'll pray uh, for his health. Uh, the doctor is needing to adjust medication. His name, by the way, is Frank Scheffler. Frank Scheffler. We'll sure be praying for him. If anyone else has any, just get online there real quick and we'll sure be <laughs> praying for you. Dr. Tom. Uh, Carolyn is going into an operation. Schedule the next week. Carolyn? Yes, but the machine that's supposed to do the operation is, is gone broke. Oh, no. It's broken. It's broken. 
That's our old Dr. Tom McCall asking us to pray for his wife. So uh, I don't know exactly how to pray for this, but uh, that the Lord's will will be done, and if the machine can be prepared and made available for next week, good. It's not fun. Amen. Well, pray for Carolyn McCall. She's the backbone behind Dr. Tom McCall. Amen. She's the one that puts his tie on straight and all that other stuff. Uh, I know what that's all about. We need the ladies, uh, that's for sure. I want to tell you this baby, Laney, that I asked you to pray for last week was only like two weeks old and was dying. The baby's going to be okay now. Praise God. You know, we asked the Lord for a lot of prayers, but we need to thank Him when He comes to And we are sure a lot of things to thank Him for. And I have a prayer request here for... David Bjork for good health and closeness to God. How many in your family need closeness to God? Uh, I just, you know, that'll solve a lot of problems, won't it, if they get close. We have another one on the net. Uh, as it happens, saying it can be taken off, so I guess it's a praise. Amen. Uh, Barbara Cockerham. Barbara uh, Cockerham. Has asked for prayers for her mother mm -hmm. in the last few weeks. Uh, she doesn't. Say what other than God's grace has been Amen. very good. God's good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I mean, thank you, Lord, for prayer. Didn't say how it was answered or what. So. Well, amen. He did. That's the main thing. And for Jerry Moore, for healing, comfort, and closeness to the Lord, of sure. And Danny for her family. And for Laura. Uh, the, many of you don't know Laura, but she's a personal friend of ours. Pray for Laura real close. God, God is on her life, and she's not willing to, to go with God yet. Amen? But she's going to. We know she's going to. Keep praying for her that the closeness of God and the Holy Spirit will lead her and direct her. And pray for this ministry. There's not many, many ministries like this. We need to support this ministry, not only financially, but with your prayers, too. Of course, the money will help on it, Dr. Tom. Kind of pay some of the bills. But uh, thank God for a ministry like this that will reach the Word of God to so many places. There's just not many places like this anymore, so we'll, we'll stand. Now, will you stand with me as we honor the Lord? Do you have another? Go ahead and stand, please. You want to tell From Dana again. From Dana? She's been having trouble with teeth. She was able to get in very quickly. Yes. Uh, she felt it was, in, other, in essence, miraculously quickly, uh, and got a root canal this morning. Amen. 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 She needs doing much better there. Well, not many people can praise the Lord for a root canal. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> You're a special person. I know that for sure. Yes, Barbara. Carolyn? Carolyn? Hope? Yes, we'll pray for hope. Pray that she will uh, come closer to the Lord. Amen. And Amen. get away from where she's at and get closer. Amen. Amen. And I've heard a lot of us here tonight saying, well, we're praying for something that never happened. But thank God maybe it never happened because God intervened. Eh? Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just lift up your name today and think of your holiness and your majesty. Thank you, Lord, that you're willing to hear us and willing to listen to us and to hear our prayers and to answer them. And we know that's through Christ. Father, we lift everyone up that's on our list tonight and, and in our hearts. And Father, we ask for healing, for closeness of God, and for salvation for all of these and even more. And Father, above all, we pray for the Holy Spirit to pray for us the things that we know not of. Lord, we pray for our soldiers all over this nation, for our preachers that they preach the truth. The Lord, help us to live for you like we never have as you draw closer. Thank you for this ministry and bless it, Lord. Bless those who watch. Keep them close to you, Father, in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. See you in church Sunday morning.